If you've never seen code that uses jQuery before, you might think that it looks pretty cryptic with all those dollar signs and braces all over the place. But once we understand how jQuery works and exactly what that dollar sign in particular means, it'll all make perfect sense. If we think about the types of things that we do in script on web pages, we'd notice that almost all of it follows a simple pattern. Select an element or a set of elements and do something to them. And if we analyze how much code goes into each of these steps, we'd notice that we spend a great deal of effort simply getting references to the things in the DOM that we want to manipulate. And that just seems wrong. We'd like to spend our energy doing things rather than expending most of it getting ready to do things. Recently, some APIs have been added that follow the proposed W3C selector API and that will make things a whole lot better. But for now, the implementations are spotty, even in the modern browsers, and they have some problems because they're currently thin layers on the old functionality. So they're kind of buggy and non-performant. jQuery scores a big win in this scenario because it makes selecting the elements that we want to work on really easy. And the selection process has been optimized up the wazoo so that it's lightning fast. So that brings us to the syntax of a typical jQuery statement. Remember that the typical pattern is select something, then do something to it. The dollar sign is nothing more than the name of the jQuery function. Yes, the dollar sign is a valid identifier character in JavaScript. We could use it ourselves in variables and function names, but it's just that nobody does. So dollar sign is just the name of a function. It could have been Fred or Fizzbad or Supercalifragilistic, but for brevity, it's just dollar sign. Or jQuery. The dollar sign and the name jQuery are aliases for each other. Most jQuery statements start by calling the dollar sign function and passing it a string. This string is called a jQuery selector and identifies what's to be selected. When called in this way, the jQuery function finds all of the elements in the DOM that match the selector and returns it as a special collection known as the jQuery wrapped set. In this case, the wrapped set returned by the call to the dollar sign function is the set of all image elements in the document. Don't worry too much about the selector syntax right now. It's going to be the focus of another part of the course. Once we have elements selected into the wrap set, we can apply any number of operations to those elements by calling methods that are defined on the wrap set. In this case, we're calling the hide method that, you guessed it, hides the selected elements. So the result of executing this statement is to hide all images on the page. The statement might look less cryptic if we had used the name jQuery in place of the dollar sign, but using the dollar sign is what all the cool kids do, unless there's a reason not to, which we'll get to in just a moment. So let's go look at an example and look at a few of those statements in this light. So here's some jQuery code to perform an Ajax operation. Uh, it may look a little bit cryptic now. Again, it's got lots of dollar signs, lots of parens, lots of braces. But remember the pattern we just saw. And if we start from the inside out, we'll notice that here we have a call to the dollar sign function, passing it a string that is a selector. And then on that, calling a method, in this case val. So we see that pattern here a string being passed to the dollar sign, and a method being called on it. If we look a little further out, we see that pattern repeating itself again. Here, we have a selector named target div being called, and on that, we're calling a method named load, passing it some parameters that actually include another jQuery statement. Looking further out, we see the pattern once again, this time, using a selector named pound sign test form and calling a function, uh, rather a method, called submit, passing it a function that in turn includes jQuery statements. This is the pattern that we're going to see time and time again. 
that particular call to the jQuery function and calling methods on it, which may include statements that contain further jQuery methods. There's another one out here that doesn't quite follow the pattern that we were talking about. So we're going to find out about that in just a moment. And that's the basic syntax of the vast majority of jQuery statements. We'll be visiting the selector syntax and the various wrapper methods in later parts of the course. The methods that we'll be examining in those later parts fall into some general categories. DOM manipulation, event handling, animations and effects, AJAX, and more that could be called utility methods. A lot of what we want to accomplish on our pages with jQuery is done through the use of the methods on the wrap set. Remember, the purpose of the wrap set is to contain a collection of elements and provide methods that operate on those elements. Those familiar with patterns will recognize that as the wrapper pattern. But jQuery also has so-called utility functions that provide useful functionality that is independent of DOM elements. For example, there are methods for dealing with sets of arbitrary data, trimming strings, queuing up functions, and even parsing JSON data. In order to keep these functions out of the global namespace, they're created as properties on the jQuery function. Because they are properties of the jQuery function, their names are all prefixed with one of dollar sign dot or jQuery dot. There's a whole slew of these and we'll be introduced to them as appropriate to the subject matter. But here are a few examples. The first one trims a passed string. The second one does the exact same thing except using the jQuery name rather than the dollar sign. Notice how the jQuery or the dollar sign is followed by the period character. That makes these calls to standalone utility functions rather than calls to wrapper methods. Making the utility functions properties of the jQuery function serves a very necessary purpose, that of keeping the intrusion into the global namespace at a minimum. jQuery adds just two names to the global namespace, jQuery and dollar sign. jQuery is obvious, and it's certainly not a name that anyone else should be using, so the possibility of a collision is pretty much nil. The dollar sign is another matter. It's simply a shorthand alias for the name jQuery and just helps to keep code as terse as possible. Either name can be used to refer to the jQuery function and they can be used interchangeably. This aversion to polluting the global namespace is a core design decision for jQuery. By minimizing the number of names that are introduced, jQuery avoids accidentally using up names that page authors might also be using. And when it comes to using multiple libraries on the same page, it avoids colliding with names defined by other libraries. The one problem is that dollar sign. Other libraries, most notably Prototype, also use the dollar sign as a name. Rather than trying to lock out other libraries, jQuery takes the exact opposite approach. In order to make it easy for users to use jQuery along with other libraries, jQuery provides a supported means to give up the dollar sign name to any library that would like to use it. This is done through a utility function named noConflict. Here's the syntax of that rather friendly utility method. It can be called using either of the jQuery or dollar sign prefixes, and it reverts the definition of the dollar sign name to whatever it was when jQuery was loaded. It has one optional parameter, which if passed, and that value is true, will cause even the jQuery name to be removed from the global namespace. Of course, once you do that, you can't use jQuery on the page anymore. Here's an example of using it. First, the prototype library is loaded, which has its own definition of the dollar sign function. After that, jQuery is loaded, which replaces the dollar sign name with its own definition for that function. But once the no conflict utility method is called, the dollar sign is returned back to the definition it had before jQuery overrode it. 
That's mighty friendly. Before diving off into more jQuery, let's find out how to get it and set it up. When using jQuery, we essentially have two choices. We can download it to our own systems and build it into our web apps for our own servers to serve. Or we can simply reference it from our pages using one of the popular content delivery networks. jQuery is available from the jQuery maintained CDN, the Google CDN, and the Microsoft CDN. Using a CDN has a few advantages. The servers used for the CDNs are pretty stout and are likely more powerful than most other servers. If the end user has visited a site that also uses the same CDN, the jQuery script file will already be cached on the user system. Our own servers won't need to be bothered. Also, browsers will limit the number of simultaneously requests that they make to each individual server, so it's quite possible that using a CDN will allow jQuery to be loaded at the same time as images or other resources from our own sites. And if we're not hosting the file, we can't accidentally edit it and screw it up. If there's a disadvantage to using a CDN, it's the reliance on remote servers that we don't control. But I don't think either of Google or Microsoft are going anywhere soon. However, there are cases where corporate filters may actually block CDNs. If such places are among our target audience, that could affect the decision to use a CDN or not. Loading the library into our pages is as easy as any other script file. Loading the library into our pages is as easy as any other script file. We can either reference it locally if we're going to be serving the file or by using the URL of a chosen CDN. In either case, be sure to use the script tag correctly. There must be a closing script tag. We can't use the XML style of self-closing tag even in XHTML. The general rule to follow is that if a tag can have content, it must have both the opening and closing tags. Another way to put it is that a tag can only be self-closing if it can never accept any content. And that's all there is to getting jQuery onto our page. jQuery will load into any browser that supports JavaScript, but it's specifically tested with the big five browsers, Internet Explorer, Safari, Firefox, Chrome, and Opera. jQuery may also work with other browsers that share rendering engines with supported browsers. For example, Camino uses the same WebKit internals as Chrome in Safari. If a supported browser runs on a platform, that platform is also supported. So it can be used in any supported browser on any of the big three platforms, Windows, Mac OS X, or Linux. This browser and platform independence means that pages can be developed in any of these environments for viewing in any of these environments. But remember, Regardless of the environment in which the pages are developed, it's always a good idea to test your pages in all environments in which you expect them to be viewed.